Well, first an important question. Do you have some water with you to drink? No, do I need some? I'm pretty well uh, hydrated. Okay, that's that's the most important part. Um, yeah. Let's jump right into it. Uh, I've been trying to skip like normal small talk, partly because I think that everyone's kind of over small talk right now. Like the yeah. whole like, how are you doing? And then an expression, a sharing of all the ways that we're not doing that great <coughs> kind of stuff and stuff that we're worried about. But um, you're busy today. You had a webinar earlier, mm-hmm. and we, which we're going to talk about more. Um, but maybe let's start with your long and impressive t- job title at the Specialty Coffee oh, Association. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It takes up two pages. I yeah. deserve it. I deserve it. Um, it's okay. So I am the Chief Sustainability and Knowledge Development Officer at the Specialty Coffee Association. Right. That's it. That's the title. Yeah. And, you know, this is like, we didn't have a lot of time to, to, to chat ahead of time, but I'm going to, you know, a little bit putting on the spot, like what I heard was that you were, like, people have been talking about you on the list of, like, this is the sort of, like, informal inner circle of sorts of uh, the SCA leadership right now. People are talking about, like, Yanis, it's like you and Cindy, Cindy Chang Ludvigson are, you know, and, you know, any, any kind of leader sort of needs to develop uh, that sort of thing. Um, but that was one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today because, you know, we, we got to hang out a little bit in Seoul, Korea and back in November, which was great. And we've known each other for a few years now. Um, but, you know, obviously there's a lot going on. We haven't, you know, we talked to Rick, uh, I guess, was it a week ago? It feels like a year ago. But um, uh, Rick Reinhardt, but he's not actively involved anymore, and he's like somewhat blissfully and happily out of the loop on a lot of things. Um, and you know, I'm sure we'll get you know Yanis, and I was trying to get Cindy on this as well. But you know, there's sort of two main topics I think that are that are relevant. I mean, aside from kind of like uh, uh, update stuff like the webinars, like we want to hear more about that, and because they're going to be regularly scheduled, scheduled, and this is something that you're going to be doing. Um, but you know, there's like two main things and you might, might've seen me kind of post about it in anticipation of this, which is, um, you know, the special coffee association is the special coffee association. So, uh, working with so many, the different facets and sectors of specialty coffee. Uh, and so, you know, different sectors have different needs. That's one of the things that's always been a challenging aspect of the, the coffee association, whether it was especially the coffee association of America before, or this unified global organization for the past few years. And then, you know, there's been association sort of stuff as well and how things kind of fit in. And, and you're the first official association staff or board person that we've had on, uh, on, on these chats so far. So yeah. Can we get into it a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, And that tension that you raise, you know, you did correctly identify that there's both the internal association stuff and then there's the external, you know, association as microcosm of a representative body for the... Do both of those. It's probably, I mean, it's probably sort of familiar to anyone. Um, It's familiar to me in sustainability because I I feel like I'm often... Um, approached by people who want to know what they can do and have a very like specific desire to, for something tangible, like mm-hmm. what kind of cup should I be using in my cafe? Are disposable cups like you know biodegradable cups? Is that a, is that a thing that I should be doing? Um, and then if I try to bring up something like farm labor and you know labor scarcity in Central America, migration, it feels really far away mm-hmm. and like that uh, that kind of tension between what's immediate to me and you know relevant to me right now and then this sort of bigger picture what's going on in the world what does the future hold it can be you know challenging to to do both of those things well at the same time and I, and, we're, and we're very much grappling with that right right so um i mean do you have any thoughts just to kick it off as far as like the overview of what i mean you you have your area of focus obviously so, I mean, it's wherever you want to start, like what, what, it, where's the association in, from where you sit, like where the, where's the attention been going? Oh, okay. Well, we, we skipped the small talk. <laughs> yeah. We talked about how things weren't so great. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's been the case 
in some ways I felt like compared to can you can, can you unplug and plug back in your microphone it's sure. getting a weird kind of yeah hold on oh that, that's better how's that that's much better better yeah okay it's, oh, we're, we're doing this on your to, yeah I'm doing it on my phone <laughs> yeah. um so uh compared to some of the people that I you know, in my local community who don't work in coffee and even people in coffee who don't work for the association, I feel like I had a little bit more concern about the coronavirus than, than others because, um, so much, and I don't know if everyone in your audience knows this about the association, but, um, a lot of our members, a lot of our stakeholders, a lot of the revenue that we, um, that we bring in comes from education that's done in Korea and in China and in Taiwan and in Italy. <laughs> so, you know, we've been seeing these, the numbers of, and most of that education happens in person. So we've right. been seeing, you know, the numbers of classes that are being held dropping since, since January. And, um, and so because of that, we've been thinking about this and talking about this and kind of aware of the fact that we were going to be impacted by this, although at the beginning it felt like it was just going to be in low attendance to Expo, mm. um, and comparisons were made to, like the you know SARS outbreak and the effects on the 2000 and I think that was the 2003 show in Boston mm. maybe, um, and uh, and how after the fact you know running the numbers it seemed like um, you could see that the attendance was down by some percentage, but. You know, it was nothing like what we're seeing, obviously. Right. Um, and then as the, you know, as the virus progressed uh, and spread, then we started to see pockets of, of concern and uh, arising in, you know, Italy. And then um, in the United States, which is, you know, where I live in the coffee community that I'm the most connected to, especially over social media, um, it felt like uh, over the past couple of weeks, it's just turned from being a conversation that's been, at least with regard to the, SCA very much about what's going to happen with the Portland show. Um, is it going to be canceled? Why aren't you canceling it? <laughs> to a conversation that's about what does the future of specialty coffee look like? Yeah. You know, not that there isn't, um, there wasn't continued interest in what was going to happen with the show, or that when we finally made the decision and announced it last week that we weren't going to postpone the show in 2020 and we were going to, you know, have the the next expo happen in 2021. That that didn't. I don't know that that there were no effects of that. Certainly, there are there are a lot of major effects of that. But I feel like in a lot of ways, the industry conversation had moved on to what are we all going to do? What are our businesses going to look like right. when this is over? Um, how do we survive something that we don't really know the end date on? Um, and you know, we're looking to the restaurant industry, looking all over the place for. Um, commiseration yeah and, uh, and but but nobody has answers right right i mean that's the thing i mean with the association and and you know people who know me know i've been involved on a volunteer level for a long time on the board and just kind of been active uh mostly in the in the shadows you know in the recent years uh i poke my head in in every so often but you know that you talk about tension you know that's it's such a that ten, the word tension is so apropos in so many ways, right? Like with the association specifically, there's always been this kind of tension between the association leading the industry and the association sort of meeting the needs of the industry and the way that those things aren't necessarily like two separate things. Sometimes they're one and the same, right? And in this situation, it's kind of like, I think that, uh, and I've heard this from other people, you know, within SCAA staff and leadership that it's like there's this feeling that we all feel right now where it's like, I want to do something. I want to do something to help. You know, how can we help? And then feeling totally helpless and ill-equipped to be able to know what help even is and even what the hell's like really going on. Things are changing so fast. Mm -hmm. Um but, you know, that sort of idea of leadership is, is obviously something that I've been thinking about a lot. I'm always thinking about it, you know, maybe too much sometimes. But um... Yeah, I think to me there's something um, that I have reminded myself of over the five years or so that I've been at the association, which is, um, you know, I've, I've seen a number of different uh, social media outcries hmm. uh, directed at the association in the time that I've been here. And, um, and sometimes, you know, that can be a, 
yeah, that can be hard to read. Yeah. But I also remind myself at those times that a lot of people who are members of this association or who, even if they're not members, come to our events or, you know, take education classes and feel like they're part of the association or the community, you know, they don't belong to... 25 different associations mm. uh, where they're comparing all the time the sort of services they get or the benefits or um, their expectations are just based on aspirationally what they want an association to do for them. So, you know, I want people to have high expectations of us and to feel like um, the work that we do is valuable and that we are uh, advocating on their behalf. And so if that sometimes means that um, people's expectations aren't met, um, I feel like I have to be okay with that, you know, that, uh, that otherwise, or like, that's part of, of leadership is, right. um, is being okay with being a disappointment, you know? Um, so I, that's not, uh, I don't mean that as an excuse yeah. for ways in which right now, like if that, the tension that we've talked about, or if we've been more internal facing, trying to work out, uh, the logistics or the, you know, legalities of the Portland contracts, and that has kept us from being as uh, as supportive to different constituents or different you know stakeholders um, as they would have liked. Then I think that that would be a, a totally valid uh, critique to make. Yeah. Um, and I feel that you know I, I feel tensions all over the place, including like um, between the you know the different like the response to the difficulties that small businesses are experiencing now in the United States and the, the feelings that I feel about that. I mean, you know, Korean businesses were feeling that two months ago yeah. and uh, or Chinese businesses. And I feel like that was not something that I was as aware of. And it just makes me, yeah, it, it just like, I feel like I have to acknowledge my American bias in that and my privilege. Yeah. And that's like... I mean, you probably you know, feel like me where like right now when you watch the news or, or anything, it feels like even though we know like intellectually it's not true like it feels like it's only happening here it's only happening to us like all yeah. you know I, I'm really grateful for YouTube as a specific platform right now because that's where I get to hear the voices of people in other countries right now and like almost no other way at this moment I mean Twitter a little bit but you know some of the stuff that that I follow on on YouTube uh, has been pushing a lot of that content to me and it's just like you know, that sobering feeling, and I've been saying this over and over again, like, it's simultaneously comforting in a collective sort of way, and then horrifying that there's no yeah. self safe haven right now, or doesn't seem to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, like, let's talk about a little bit, again, like, it's early, and, and none of this stuff is meant to put you on the spot or, or, or anything. I'm just curious as to whether there have been any conversations yet uh, within leadership at the Specialist Coffee Association regarding like, so, you know, we have these different kind of cohorts, these different categories of, of the industry. Um, I mean, are, are, are you hearing a lot of stuff now from folks? Is, is that kind of like feedback loop, you know, been getting back to you all? Like, Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so my friend of yours doing a webinar later this week about the results of a survey that we um, we opened for about a week, um, about a week ago, on the impacts of the virus. And it wasn't uh, it wasn't like the member surveys that we've done at times, where we try to get a really representative sample mm -hmm. and a you know certain amount of a certain percentage of responses in order to feel like the results are credible. It wasn't like that. It was a flash poll, so it's going to be um, you know, skewed toward certain geographies, we only did it in English, mm -hmm. all, all the caveats apply right. there. Um, but I think that it is also um, at least a way in which we can uh, put a little bit of substance to what we hear from social media, from what we hear anecdotally um, from people, because uh, at the same time that there are um, so, so many, especially small, but businesses that are, that are really suffering and in a very scary place right now, um, you know, there are also stories that aren't being told. And, um, and in a few cases, those stories are probably about business growth. Um, and it makes sense that you might not hear those because it's a strange time to be celebrating. Um, you know, any kind of strange time to be celebrating in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, then I think others of those stories have to do with like 
and, and people ask the question, but what are the impacts of this on, on you know, the producing side of the coffee value chain? Um, you know, we're seeing this happening and we know that sometimes the effects are going to be delayed, uh, but some of them aren't. And if we're not hearing those stories, is it because the effects aren't that bad? Or is it because, you know, of, uh, of who we're listening to? Mm. Um, is it because of, you know, fear that, uh, that you know, spreading bad news or like uh, expressing that instability or projecting instability <clears throat> is going to then be a self-fulfilling prophecy? Right. Right. It's a good, it's such a good question. I, I'm getting, the, my next guest for the series is going to be Edwin Martinez. Mm -hmm. um, you know him. Can you? I keep like bossing oh, you around. Just move. Yeah, just move okay. it. Just just so it's not on I your have, collar. Like, a whole, you know, recording setup, but I thought that this it's, was. It's a... okay. No, this is great. This is great. Um, but that's that's that is a really interesting thought. The idea that like, I mean, it's almost it, there's an a analogy there. It's, it's it's obviously really not perfect, but like with you know healthcare workers, where it's like mm -hmm. you know there there are moments where people who are used to setting themselves aside in the interest of uh, their customer slash patient slash whatever, who, you know, they're just used to kind of seeing things in that way. I mean, you could yeah. call it a power imbalance. You could call it, you know, just whatever. But that, uh, I never thought of it that way, the idea that, like, the producers would um, be more focused on attending to our needs on the consuming side more so than focused on like how they can. Yeah. That's what they're accustomed to. Right. Yeah. 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 I think it, you know, there is, um, there has been a, you know, an outpouring of, um, a feeling and a lot of generosity expressed by a lot of, uh, producers and producer organizations about, you know, how hard this is and, you know, how much they want to express solidarity with baristas, with, you know, coffee shop owners who are, um, we're experiencing these uh, these effects um, that isn't doesn't have anything to do with like the personal motivation of and I hope you keep buying mm -hmm. coffee you know right uh, just because we are and you know we are all connected not in you know not everyone I'm not trying to like make some sort of uh, yeah. bland statement of unity but um, but you know I think that uh, it would also be you know to be unfair to suggest that. Uh, that in the same way that many baristas and retailers like care about producer welfare and have been caring now for some years, as we've talked about all of the threats to the sustainability of the industry that are experienced most by producers, that now that we're seeing a, a legitimate you know threat and it's so it feels so insurmountable at this moment that's um, that's expressing itself on the consumption end yeah. that it doesn't evoke the same kind of emotional response and desire for you know for solidarity among producers mm. that's it yeah it's interesting yeah I, i'm again i'm definitely for personally like interested in delving more to that side and get more folks from from various sort of produce like areas within producing side of things um yeah. you know to, to talk to them more to, to hear more stories and find out what's going on um so it's a global association I mean, there's always, there's been, <laughs> go back to tension, like, you know, usually we think about, we usually we think about, are you there, you're like, I don't know if it's my internet connection. I'm that, here, like, you broke up for a second. Yeah, it's weird, like, I have a fiber internet that's like a gigabit, it's like super fast, but mm -hmm. then every Skype call I've done, like every three minutes or so it's like for everything freezes for like 10 seconds mm. it's annoying i have trouble with i've had bad luck with skype yeah uh, it might be yeah. skype it, these days i mean yeah. i think a lot of people are using a lot of these things yeah, more than before too. so yeah. yeah but um i was saying that like usually when we think about you know again the idea of tension it ends up being like between two things mm -hmm. but you know one of the things that i think has been that's which euphemism to use, like uh, a challenge when it comes to, especially the Coffee Association, through like into the merger and then through the merger has been that like when you're a global association, uh, it's it you can't necessarily, I mean, in some ways you can, but in most ways you can't really prioritize like one country or market over another, right? Like it's, it's truly a global thing. So then all of a sudden it's like, you know, whereas it, at first it felt like we have the European Association, the American Association. Now we got two, 
two to deal with. No, not mm-hmm. each that each one of those has like 50 inside, you know, yeah. kind of thing. It's like, you know, Pandora's box. So, um, I mean, have you been seeing anything you talk about in terms of like the diversity of, uh, if you can generalize even within those countries, like a diversity of what you, you all are hearing from various corners of the industry? Yes, but I don't know that the virus is necessarily like accelerated that or changed it. I uh-huh. think that, um, you know, the tension that you're describing is something that uh, that has been very much on my mind, you know, as um, as we have gone from, like you said, feeling like, OK, you know, America Association, European Association. Mm-hmm. But actually, the European Association has this huge contingent that's in Korea. Right. So it's the European Association. But um, and then at the same time, if you go to the you know, the North American Expo, then you're going to see an incredible representation of coffee producing organizations from Central and South America. Mm-hmm. So it's not really just the United States either. Um, and that's expanded and uh, and been accelerated a lot. You know, you have a couple of friends who are on our uh, board of directors now, which is a much more um, like a geographically diverse group. I mean, much more diverse in most ways that you would measure diversity. But yeah. Um, a lot of, uh, of different of geography um, that's never been represented before. You know, multiple board members from Africa for the first time ever. Whoop, whoop. Um, yeah, and yeah. so uh, that is uh, that's just it's really changing, like uh, or it's made it so impossible to ignore that uh, when we say global association, we have to you know actually think about and uh, and and establish what we mean by global association we right. can't just say it aspirationally we have to be demonstrating even if it's slow that we are doing that work to be more than the american and, and european association that's accessible to people who speak english and come and find us and you know show up at our events and um and so i don't know that the virus makes that easier mm. uh i i think that it it changes the context for so many things. It changes the context of the conversations. It changes the um, what's the most immediate concern, but it doesn't change the um, you know the like purpose of the organization to connect people and and be a place where um, professional development can occur and learning. And um, so it's just it's like you know I don't know. I mean, it does change some things, but then other things are. It, the same conversation it, it seem, about something different. Right. It would seem as that, like, now that I think about it, whereas I think maybe before the assumption might have been, if we knew this was coming, for instance, like, you know, which we kind of did, but, you know, if, if we knew more about what was going to happen, I think the assumption would have been that people would have, like, really been turning to the association for help a lot more. But I guess what's probably happening more is that they're kind of almost turning their backs, not on purpose but like they're de- everyone has shit to deal with right now and where as usually the association is what you turn to not when you're like in life or death situation or like when your business is falling apart or anything it's more about tap you know new markets and new opportunities and new education and you know sort of thing you know you, you use the word aspirational before it's like uh, you know it's about growing and and learning and in a way it's like people don't necessarily have to yeah they don't have the bandwidth for that right everyone's dealing with other stuff which again like changes the perspective for when you are you know on staff or 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 active with the association like how does your role change in that situation. I mean, I was thinking about it the other day. I forgot who I was talking to, but I was actually talking to a board member and just thinking about how, like, yeah, like, right now, if I were in part of leadership, you know, unsolicited, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's like, there's, is that sort of question of, like, what can we do now? And then starting to, you know, even if it's always changing, starting to kind of, like, develop the uh, the post crisis like when we have a vaccine or when this starts to like you know on the downslope 
um, because that's going to be a different chapter, right, for, for the whole industry in terms of what the needs are going to be, because that's like the, the reconstruction time, so yeah. to speak. Like we might, who knows, we might even be calling it that at some point, right? Like reconstruction, like the new reconstruction, um, you know, on a global level for the industry as well as just for everybody. Um, yeah, I agree with that. And, um, you know, last year, you mentioned talking to Rick Reinhardt. Uh, last year, I worked closely with Rick on this coffee price crisis response initiative um, that the SCA launched. And uh, and one of the analogies that Rick liked to use was of a, um, you know, a heart attack. Mm. I probably said this on a, in conversation with you or you saw him say it on the RICO stage. But um, this idea that, you know, if this is a crisis, then we treat that both in the short term, and then we also, you know, change our lifestyle over the long term. Um, and uh, I don't know if the heart attack metaphor works quite so well here, but uh, if we use it, we, if we use that metaphor, then um, I think that people, you know, to what you said about turning their backs on the association, I think that there is a, a pulling inward that happens, you know, when people are, are feeling threatened. Yeah. Um, and that there are ways in which you know, a local community organization, your local chamber of commerce um, may have more to offer right. in this particular moment than a global coffee association. Um, and that's not only true now. I mean, you know, we have uh, multiple people or companies on our represented on our board that are B Corps. Mm. And one of the things that I've liked about the B Corp movement is that um, it offers the opportunity for cross industry learning. Mm. So, you know, you're not only seeing the best practices of other coffee companies, you're also seeing how uh, accounting firms are approaching being a good business. Right. Um, and so I think that there are um, that right now, yeah, some of that, uh, that coffee community might be counterbalanced by a, um, a you know, a local community or a, you know, something that feels very specific to that business in their operating environment. Um, more than that, that connectivity, but that um, as soon as there's a, a chance for hope, you know, as soon as you sort of want to see what recovery might look like, that there are a lot of other, or, you know, or if you want to commiserate, um, but that there are a lot of examples of that outside of your local community too. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the insight that you might need or the connections that you might need in order to reconstruct um, or ones that you could find through the uh, through the association. Yeah. I mean, have you thought about it personally, like in terms of what any, you know, off the top of your head over the past few days or weeks in terms of what could be, again, I won't hold you to it, you know, but like any personal sort of predictions or um, kind of things that you're anticipating or is it too early? That's... Yeah. I mean, it's not just that it's too early. Um, or that I feel like uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing has been internal facing in mm -hmm. the what is the SCA going to be, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, but I also feel like this is a time of such high emotion, you know, that um, that I, that it's, it's just hard. You know, yeah. it's hard to venture anything that feels like because what I really want to do is to to just sort of be there and be in it with mm -hmm. anyone who's going through it versus like predicting anyone's demise right? or predicting anyone's need to need to evolve. I mean, I think people, many people probably already know that they need to evolve and that's a, an uncomfortable place to be, whether it's inspired by this virus or inspired by a conversation that you had with a loved one or whatever it is. It's like, that's you isn't always a, you know, kind thing to do. And I think that like being kind is something that I'd like to really practice right now. Yeah, me too. I was, uh, why are you frozen right now? Come on, Skype. Um, no, you're unfrozen. You were frozen for a second. I was. Well, yeah, yeah you're good now. This is the Skype life. Um, yeah, no, I, I hear, I hear you on that. I, I appreciate that perspective a lot. I mean, I mean, in a way, like you're, you're, but you know, you're saying that because you're, you know, concerned that there's a lot of kind of bad news or, or, um, now you're really frozen. You're still frozen. This is weird. Maybe mm -hmm. let me call, let me hang up and call right back. Okay. Okay. One second. We'll do this really fast. This will happen really quickly. Everyone hang loose. We're going to call right 
back and it's everything's going to be great. <laughs> I think we're better now. Ooh, much better. I think better? Wait, why is this not... Why is this... Why is this not... That's so weird. All of a sudden... Oh, there you are. Why is this not coming up? Come on, buddy. There you are. Okay, great. Okay, now we're fully back. It was like the software couldn't find the Skype for a second. Um, yeah. I was saying that, like, I think a lot of people are really afraid that um, a lot of businesses are going to, like, be gone. I mean, mm -hmm. like... Maybe it's that too many of us saw the Avengers uh, Endgame movie where it's like snap away like a bunch of, of humanity or whatever, or, you know, living creatures in the universe. I mean, what, Trish? I heard her holler from the other room. She's wa she watches these things from the other room, so I don't know if it was. <laughs> um, the Avengers Endgame. Yeah, just that like, I think there is this assumption that a lot of stuff is going to be gone. But, you know, the fact is that something would have to be there. I mean, yeah, I, to replace I'm not it? Yeah. That's, and I guess when I'm saying that uh, predicting the demise, it's like, I think that things, because of high sensitivities, that are just trends that exist in the world uh -huh. could end up sounding like uh, I'm predicting an individual you know, failure. I just, I feel like, oh, I you know, there's a sensitivity that wouldn't have been there a few months ago mm -hmm. if I said that, like, you know, one of the big, the things that I'm really excited about was six months ago, will continue to be, am now, is uh, domestic coffee consumption. Right. You know, the, um, the At growth home. and, uh, <laughs> I was thinking in domestic markets, like You're in coffee producing like countries. Like in Brazil and, okay, right. Yeah. Like, uh, we've talked about this at Rico for the past couple of years, you know, we've, um, all sorts of different uh, um, takes on this have, have come out and, uh, and individual cases that are, you know, coffee shops or supply chains that are really beautiful, uh -huh. um, national level stories that are exciting about like what it means for, um, producing organizations to have other, uh, markets for their coffee and, um, and you know, what domestic buyers understand or how, how people drink coffee. Anyway, those are things that I feel like I have been excited about, but um, framed as a prediction that we would say more domestic consumption. I think that, you know, that's one of those things that depending on how you're listening to this and what feeling you bring to it feels now like, what's it like American coffee shop? You're just going to go away, you know? Right. And that's, um, I, I agree with you. Something will replace it. It's not, you know, nothing's going to, um, I don't, I find like absolutes pretty difficult to wrap my head around under any circumstance. Um, and especially when we don't know. And that certainty, I think uh, a desire for certainty is especially compelling when it feels like so much is unstable and uncertain that that idea that you can know something for sure, but like, what do we know for sure? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Trish was talking to me this morning about like, kind of upping our game on the uh, whole bean side, like selling to whole bean for people to brew coffee at home. And, you know, we're thinking about the idea that that's going to be, um, you know, in a positive way, an opportunity and in a more practical way, a bit of a hedge, right? You know, like if, if cafes are, are going to be less of a thing because people are less comfortable going out, um, in you know crowded spaces and interacting with each other in such close quarters, um, then yeah, then you know we'll see. I I still think that like I, I don't know. I think that the the we're we're predicting the demise of the coffee shop a little bit too quickly. Um, I do think that I personally, in my career, you know, unlike you or a lot of other folks, like my focus has always been like like at the cafe at the sort of barista level. And so, um, you know, I, I've always found that when we talk about, when we talk to people who are thinking more on a macro level when it comes to the industry, like you and other people at the association, or like, you know, anyone who, who is even, whether it's part of their job or just like talking about these things, there always does sort of end up being a bias. Like it's in that human way, where it's like a bias toward a certain 
pri like priorita prioritizing like a certain segment. It's like, I mean, you, you've seen it, right? It's like, you know, your focus for years has been very much on, uh, you know, on the producer side of things, you know, and, and even when you have been involved on the retail side uh, for, you know, when you're at Counterculture and onward, it's been like on a sustainability focused kind of like perspective. Um, and with this special association in general, I would say like during, if you might call it like the Rick Reinhardt era from 07, you know, up to like you know, a year or two ago, um, it really was a lot more shifting the focus toward, um, you know, producers and, you know, producer issues and, you know, global issues around production. Um, you know, when <laughs> Rick would give his talk, his sort of state of the industry speech at the beginning of Rico Symposium every year, um, like 80% of it would be focused on, at least would be on producer type stuff. Um, I think that's true for, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it is true that there, that, you know, shift has happened and that uh, during that period, um, the kind of importance of for a lot of good reasons, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. Yeah. Considering that entire, you know, um, the the whole value stream that um, that creates coffee, I think right. that has become more uh, brought into sharper focus. But I think that that also kind of under underplays the um, the role that the association has taken. Like, and and it was actually even a, a stated priority. Um, of the association at one point to raise the um, awareness of and elevate the position of the barista yeah. as the point of contact with the consumer. And that right. happened during those same years. No, so it's totally. not one or the other. You know, I think that, um, and it wasn't even like, uh, I think, a concerted effort to say, well, we have to approach both ends of the chain. You know, that that sort of language of like one side, the other side. Well, it was We're a correction Creating of a sorts, balance. Right. Um, I see it as without it being, I mean, in hindsight, I can see that as like recognizing where vulnerability was mm -hmm. and still is. Um, and I think that, uh, that during that same time, um, potentially either on the barista side or at least within the association, you know, the creation of a barista guild, the growth of competitions, like all of these different factors combined and, and the success maybe professionally of a certain group of baristas that were very vocal within the, um, the association community in early years might have led us to believe that, um, that, okay, we seem to be doing okay with, uh, with baristas. And mm. meanwhile, the commodity futures price for coffee, the profitability of coffee farming, um, all of those things continue to go down and, uh, and the, you know, maybe we need to invest more on that side, but, Again, I don't think that it can be one or the other. And so you're right that my focus has been more on the production side because that's where I've seen the greatest sustainability threats to be. Yeah. But, you know, this present moment, it makes it really obvious that it's not just on the production side that we have, you know, major threats. Oh, most definitely. I mean, I was talking about, like, just for the association in general. I mean, the, you're, you're absolutely right that there that as there was more a necessary focus put on producer issues that there was also simultaneously um, an emphasis on baristas. You know, I, I think that from just being sort of an industry pundit and, you know, keeping an, again, knowing a lot about just sort of, sort of how the association has gone over the years and just in terms of leadership in general, that like it, it does end up being a lot in many ways. Uh, it's, a series of corrections of sorts, you know, it's like, okay, it's like course correcting, like trying to keep things straight. Uh, what's always been interesting, and then when you think about it, almost like in a forensic way, when you think about, when you think about over the past few years, the past 10 years or so, about like the moments that there have been some stress or tension or like, you know, an outcry of sorts, it ends up being from a constituency or a perspective that was the perception at least for that group was that they were being underserved at that moment or like not prioritized enough. You mm -hmm. know, I think about like when, you know, it, whether it was like the Dubai thing, you know, or whether it was like when, you know, getting rid of the regional barista competitions, like, you know, just to focus on mm -hmm. baristas for a second, you know, both, both of those were not um, like intentional, uh, uh, you know, whatever, like the, 
I, I, there's no such thing as an intentional oversight, but you know what I'm saying? Like, the, you know, these were things that yeah. were, uh, in hindsight, feel like oversights. But in the moment, you know, there were they were decisions that were made for good reasons um, or, you know, or, th- or thought so anyway. But it just ends up being like, you know, I know that just running my company, how often I find myself like taking a moment and thinking about like, well, what's eerily quiet right now? Like, where yeah. are there issues that are actually not asking for my attention but that I better check in and make sure or else, you know, these things are going to come back and, and bite you kind of thing. But like, it is interesting to think about moving forward, how the association is going to then respond and react to, you know, everything that's happening. Um, it's interesting, you know, and, and with the leadership change that's happened, you know, to get into that a little bit with, you know, Giannis Apostolopoulos as, you know, as CEO, not even executive director now, but, you know, CEO, like change in structure, change in, in you know, scope, um, you know, like we talk about these things, you know, we can talk about a little bit without getting too in the weeds, but, you know, Rick's leadership style is very different from Giannis's and I think Giannis already has identified for a lot of folks that that his yeah his his way like it's just very very different and his way of want like vision for the association you know maybe different and I think that there's been a lot of folks talking a little bit about more empowerment at the at the national and local level you know than than maybe before you know that that uh, in a in a way that is again like sort of a a correction thing. Like uh, back when I first started in volunteering with the association, like before Rick was executive director, um, you know the staff was very reactionary, responsive to members, but not really leading in an administrative way or like really in really any way. It was they weren't about leading anything. It was about like you know kind of admin support whereas you know now with you and so many others you know fast forward like 15 years and you have a very strong staff of hyper capable people who are very capable of of exerting and and demonstrating a lot of leadership in so many ways um that you know and and now when the world is changing then to see uh you know how the staff changes and how the leadership changes association. It'll be sure be interesting. It'll be interesting yeah. to see. Well, it's another example of that balance. I think, you know, as you're talking about the, um, the course correction, like that, uh, that I think that probably, I don't know, like within any group that's advocating for itself in the example of the, um, Dubai decision or, um, within the the SCA right now, like, you know, any individual person, there's going to be a wide range of ways of working or like sort of suitable solutions, you know, that it doesn't just have to be one way, but there's also familiarity, things that you know, um, change is hard, change takes time. And I think that that's actually more important to, uh, to remember is not that it's hard, yeah. um, but that uh, sometimes it's hard because we're not expecting it to take time or planning for it. I mean, that certainly feels like I lived that in the merger of mm. the um, of the SCAA and the SCAE is that uh, we didn't allow, and everyone was, you know, I think totally willing to accept this after the fact that we didn't plan for enough integration time. Um, we expected that it was going to be easier, and it seems like such a silly thing to say. Uh, like, you didn't think a merger was going to be hard? Everyone knows that mergers are hard, except that you don't know exactly what it's going to, like, what the challenges are going to be, or you plan for a certain set, but then other things arise and um, and once things slow down, then you get people who are feeling frustrated with you. And so I think that some of that is probably um, what, you know, what we experience um, all the time with any kind of, uh, with any kind of change. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, that reminds me, I mean, the, one of the things about change on a sort of group institution, you know, whatever sort of level that's, really really hard that i see all the time is that sometimes the change that's necessary the folks that are i mean i guess what how am i trying to say, say this that that very often when people think about change and the scope of things that need to happen 
that folks get limited a lot by their own capabilities. And yeah. their own, you know, obviously their own imagination and creativity, like that's sort of normal. But even in terms of like what they themselves are capable of, and when I say they, I mean like just the collective, right? Like no mm -hmm. individual. And so um, that's always a challenge too. I mean, I would anticipate that going forward that like the structure and sort of like the guts of the association would need to change just as much, if maybe even more than the... Um, than just like the purpose and stated sort of mission and goals kind of thing, you know. If you were to not not to not to like reverse anthro or objectify everyone, but you know, if 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 the staff and the leadership sort of represent a, a toolbox, you know, then it, it is a good question to see like you know what ways is, are those tools the right tools for the job that we have going forward. Yeah, well, like that um, that idiom about if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Yeah. You know, everything looks like a nail. Um, then I, I, feel, I do feel like having a, this is like an argument for diversity, you know, having a, a wide variety of tools makes you better able to do a wide variety of jobs, yeah. which I think in a, an association that aspires to be global, like there's no way that we're not going to be doing a wide variety of jobs. Um, and so that means diversity in terms of like who our staff is, but then also, um, you know, how we as individuals are able to adapt. Um, so being willing to you know, adapt to uncertain circumstances. And now that's playing out globally, but you know, there are plenty of examples of that where that's playing out at a much smaller scale and yeah. we're still scrambling a little bit because we're being met with, um, with, you know, challenges that our previous experience didn't prepare us for. Right. And I think that, you know, generational transition is another thing that as you were talking, uh, just occurred to me that, you know, it, it never, like we all agree that it has to happen, mm. but I don't know of any circumstances where it, it is actually like a friendly thing, the, right. uh, the, the generation of transition. And we talk about it a lot in, um, in coffee and sustainability circles about the need for that uh, in production because we're seeing, uh, you know, the average age of coffee farmers increase. So now it's, you know, right. uh, upwards of 50, upwards of 60 in right. some countries. Um, and we all know that that's unsustainable. And if you ask uh, older people about it, they'll wring their hands and they'll say that young people don't want to work on farms. Right. But, you know, Coffee Kids um, did a, some surveying last year, some studies in the programs that they have. And uh, one of the things that they identified, um, yet talking to young people, was that young people felt like, you know, I want to work on the farm, but nobody listens to my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it was so refreshing because it felt to me like, right, that's what it looks like from a younger person's perspective. It, right. it, it isn't always that the, you know, the romance of the city is calling. Like, there are plenty of people who do want to stay, but feel like you're not making any space for me. Mm. You know, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't want to farm the way you farmed. That doesn't look like it's not going that well for you. <laughs> you right. know, why would I want to do that? Right. And I think that the same thing is true in, um, you know, I'm using that that producer example because they did the survey. But um, the same thing is true in organizations. The same Absolutely. thing is true in, you know, consuming side businesses. Um, there's a, you know, management challenge for all of us. Yeah. Um, jumping topics. Let's talk about your webinars. Oh, yeah. So we um, decided, gosh, it feels like a couple of weeks ago now, but I don't know that it was. It might have been last week. <laughs> it might have been yesterday. Um, but working with a, a couple of my colleagues, uh, whom you know, Ellie Hudson, uh, Well, and Julie Hausch, um, we were talking about how to, you know, how to respond and, and be available and connect. And one of the things that, um, that I've done a lot of over the few years I've been at the association is webinars. Um, and part of it is because I'm just more comfortable than some people. Your microphone's with, slipping um, again. Oh, it's slipping again. Okay, Sorry. more comfortable than some people uh, with just going uh, and talking, even if I don't know all the answers to the questions that I'm going to be asked. Mm. Uh, and within the association and the community, even when it was just the American Association, a more kind of international audience, um, a lot of people who could never make it to a, an event in the United States. So we've just done a lot of uh, of digital communication um so we decided that we could do some webinars and uh and hey Cam, talk oh, you're frozen again hold, hold on oh. come on stupid skype all right i'm gonna dial you right back again okay <laughs> sorry everyone this is so annoying uh let's call her back this can't keep happening 
I think it's just a Skype system. All right, come back to me. Come on now. All right. We are... Are we working? Are we working? I, I see we you. Working? Yes. Okay, we're good. Wait. Okay. Why are you? Yes. Okay, good. I don't know where you lost me. Did you lose any of what I was saying or just my face? Just your face. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that... Uh, Anyway, just like creating space to connect and have some discussion. Um, you know, we've been doing uh, as an association until this week, like a few webinars hosted by the guilds. Um, but uh, I feel like this week we're ramping it up more, not just in sustainability, but I mentioned the research webinars and the survey um, using the communication platform that we have and this wide audience. And, um, and one thing I like about webinars is that uh, they allow for interaction and mm. um there are times when that there's a risk in that you know you give someone a microphone and they use it to make a statement um as opposed to asking a what coffee people or, never do stuff like that are you kidding <laughs> or to argue you know um which might not have been your intention but that uh yeah that like uh the openness and the um, the ability to listen as well as to present outward is something that I, I value about mm -hmm. them. So um, we left some, this is one of those examples of uh, like leaving some details um, open, but uh, we left some space for the uh, participants in the webinars to guide us in what we talk about in the later sessions. Um, but then also um, just pick some topics that are big and broad and potentially have some um some resonance in this moment, uh, like the next one's on living income and living mm. wage, um, which is not something that the SCA has been particularly um, at the forefront of to date, uh, but it's in like a, a movement and a um, way of looking at uh, sustainability that, uh, that certainly has a lot of, um, there's a lot to learn for coffee there and it, most of the work that's been done so far has been done from the production side um looking at living incomes for coffee producers what would that entail how big a piece of an income can coffee provide mm -hmm. um depending on on where you are and what kind of farm you have um but i think that those questions translate also over to the um you know the consumption side like what does living income look like for someone who's a business owner in the united states what does a living wage look like for a, a barista um and then as you start to explore any of those things what tensions you know back to tensions what tensions does that raise mm -hmm. um between supply chain actors uh what are the implications of meeting these goals once we set them those numbers can be kind of scary like what does that mean does yeah. mean we have to change um how fast no, can we change? But um, but again, I think that all the, it's like one avenue to some of those uh, those bigger uh, picture conversations that get to what's the industry going to look like on the other side of right. this. Right. Is that what you talked about this morning at this morning's webinar? No, this morning's was more of a, an introduction and background. Okay. Like, why are we doing this series? Um, we asked the people who attended to um, to do a couple of polls on, you know, uh, is sustainability um, more important to your business now, less important to your business now than it was. Um, and Depends what kind, what kind of sustainability, right? Yeah. <laughs> like the sustainability of my business. Like, is yeah. it going to be around? Like, yes, that's the thing. Sure. Yeah. And then, and then had some discussion afterwards about like, what are, what are the different roles that people have and where do they see themselves as having impact? Because mm. um, that, again, that's a really like depending on who you have on a call or who you have in a discussion, you might get something from like composting my coffee grounds to my coffee purchasing model to, uh, and there's not a, a right answer right. there either, you know, and the, the SCA is not going to say, okay, everyone, like we're all going to do this. We're all going to do climate change, you right. know, whole industry. Impact happens by uh, like, a pretty high, high carbon footprint, at least for the Specialty Coffee Association. Right. But, um, you know, that isn't necessarily the biggest impact that every individual could have if we were trying to talk about, uh, you know, reducing carbon emissions or, you know, mitigating climate change. Yeah, I've been really thinking a lot as I've been sort of fighting for my business and sort of working on uh, trying to keep things going. Just uh, what I keep coming back to is this idea of like, you know, we're specialty, you know, we're not just 
coffee were specialty coffee. So, like, you know, what the, in this climate and in, in what, with what's going on, what does the specialty and specialty coffee mean anymore? You know, yeah. or does it mean right now? And for me, it's really been like the same things just in a different version of it right in yeah. other words like different like differentiation mm -hmm. um uh tr and and we've been successful at that like i keep saying this over and over again like i'm embarrassed by how successful we've been through this um in, in light of all the folks who are suffering and and have so much loss and you know so much to be sad about that you know our cafes are actually doing pretty well right now um you know we're this week we're above pre-crisis sales numbers at our two cafes our wholesale is really down so it's our as, as a net we're down as a company but um but the but for me like a guiding thing is really it's sort of cheesy but has been like what's the specialty in specialty coffee like yeah. if we're supposed to be this special thing then what does that mean now what can we provide for people so um yeah and then so you have one coming up on thursday what's the focus they're going to be that's the one that's going to be about living income. Okay. But I don't want to let that comment about, you know, the special and specialty pass without, uh, you know, boosting it. Because I think that that's a really great question. And that is like a, a question for the ages, you know, not just a question for this moment. Um, but are we really are we realizing like all of the many facets of what specialty means, you know, or, yeah. or have we interpreted that very narrowly? Mm. Um, or too narrowly, at least, you know, because like, obviously, there is a lot of value that your cafes are providing to people who are, are buying coffee from you, that might be different. And, and maybe, like, judging by your numbers, it's an increased or there, there's more value there than there was before. And that's not because like your coffee magically t got to taste, it tastes better. Right. Now, you know, right. it's not the cup quality that's bringing people to your business right now. Right. You know, which would suggest that the interpretation of specialty that we often you know, refer back to as a fundamental is maybe a smaller, a sort of a smaller factor um, than we would like to like to believe. Well, that like that whole question of specialty, I mean, in a way, not to get too political, but it's a little bit like, you know, having being part of the Democratic Party or identifying as a Democrat, but then having like these Biden, Bernie, like, you know, whatever, like, like these different conversations about uh, what it means to be dot 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 right like mm -hmm. that uh over the past few years i think that as the association has grown in so many ways that definition of specialty has grown with it and with that type of like the tent getting bigger you know there is sort of a corresponding uh um like I don't want to say, it's not a weakening. You know what I'm getting at? Like, you know, it, it, by becoming more sort of larger and more ecumenical, more sort of encompassing, more diverse. And it's not that the definitions, and, and when I say definitions, again, you know, I don't mean 80 plus kind of stuff, but just in general, like in all the different definitions that we, we live with in the specialty coffee sector, that um, it feels like things have gotten bigger tent as much while like the, the whole tent has definitely moved in a certain direction. Um, and in that way, like I feel good about it personally uh, for what it's worth. But at the same time, like there is a sense of loss. There is a sense yeah. of like, you know, it used to be that we were like the opposition party, you know, mm -hmm. or it felt like, you know, it felt like being like a Bernie person or something where it was like, we need this revolution in coffee. You know, we need yeah. radical change in, in the way that people consume coffee, the way we brew it, like everything. And as that has become absolutely more mainstream, and I could go on and on about like the mainstreaming of like yeah. third wave, it's fascinating, I think. But um, but that, yeah, that like maybe this is going to be the, you know, kind of a, a reset for, I don't know, like some, I start saying like maybe this, maybe that, and then I'm like, shut up, Nick. like you know yeah. like let's we'll, we'll we'll ride it out we'll do our thing and then we'll find out what comes out on the other end yeah so how do people get onto the webinars uh go to sca.coffee slash news and we have all of the webinars including ones that are not in this sustainability umbrella mm -hmm. uh listed there i mean it's an increasingly like we've just sort of 
won't go into all the details, but yeah. um, but reorganized a lot of the information so that we are uh, prioritizing the things that people can find online and can participate in. So uh, it should all be there, and then individual links will send you to the registration pages for the uh, for the webinars, and um, they're happening at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific on Tuesdays and at um, twice on Thursdays, once at noon Pacific, so a little bit later. And then once at 3 a.m., so probably not for people who are on Pacific time, uh, but a little bit more accessible to uh, <laughs> Europe, Middle East, um, Africa. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks for the yeah. chat. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, what, I'm I'm doing this. one last question is tell us the story of the picture that you sent me with you and the kids. Oh, I, um, so I was uh, with my dad. Uh, who and my kids and um, all of them, well, my kids obviously live in North Carolina where I live, but my dad does too. My parents are, um, are not that far away. Uh -huh. And back in the fall, we went to this uh, place called Three Bears Acres, which is out kind of in the country uh, in North Carolina. And it's like a, it's, it's not exactly an amusement park. Um, it's sort of like a uh, very, but it's a, it's a lovely little place. I'll just keep it at that. Yeah. But uh, one of the rides that they have at this pseudo amusement park is um, those little uh, carts that you uh, ride down a on a wooden track, and then there's a piece of astroturf at the bottom that slows you down. <laughs> and so we got up to the top, and uh, and you know I just didn't realize how fast I was going to go. I watched my kids do it a couple of times, but you know I'm so much bigger than they are. I'm putting but your picture up on the thing. Snow. And uh, and my dad was taking pictures of us and um, and caught that uh, that gem where I was uh, clearly expressing how um, fearful I was at that moment it's while my so kids great. were just having a blast behind me. <laughs> it's so great, and I love I love that you sent it to me as your. As I asked you know every time I. Uh, been inviting people on like send me a picture of yourself that you like and ho yeah. preferably in, in in horizontal orientation and i'm looking at it like yeah you know going down a hill not knowing what's gonna happen next <laughs> yeah i, yeah, I love it wasn't it. even a comment on the um on the current you know virus situation it was just like most of the time you know you're sort of expected to when you send photos it's like within a sort of certain range of what's acceptable professionally. Yeah. And I felt like with you, you know, I could send a picture of myself no, on a roller coaster with my kids. It's really, it's really great. You're like hanging on. And of course, like your kids, <laughs> your kids are like, wee they're like happy. <laughs> this is fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Why are you so scared? Yeah. Take care. Be yeah. safe. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye, Nick. Bye-bye.